Hello and welcome to the Essex Boys Murder Case, Part 39. Before watching this video, I recommend watching Part 4, onwards on YouTube first, as these videos are all about the key individuals and the murder victims movements on the day of the 6th of December 1995. Um, a quick mention to the Facebook page called The Real Essex Boys Murder Club. If you're interested, please feel free to join, as there's some great people on there uh, with a lot of knowledge on this subject. So, this is the sixth part of the reconnaissance missions done by Mick Steele, Jack Wombs, Darren Nichols, and anyone else a few weeks before and on the day before the triple murders. I'm using phone log evidence witness statements and Darren Nichols' version of events according to his second statement as he says he had no prior knowledge the murders were going to take place. In part one, um, I discussed how they chose a murder location, um, a meeting place where they could uh, start their journey uh, on the evening of the murders and a plan to lure Tucker Tate and Rolf uh, to their deaths. In part two, I discussed how Mick Steele had to be a passenger in the Range Rover uh, to lure them to the chosen murder location so he could not be a shooter uh, when the ambush begins. I discussed how Darren Nichols had the chance to buy a firearm uh, but changed his mind and devised a plan at the last moment to be a getaway driver, uh, which left Jack Wombs, who had access to two unlicensed shotguns. Um, I also covered the possibility of them hiring a hitman from the Boers, who are a notorious Canning Town crime family. In part three, I discussed how they did a, a recce a few weeks before the murders. Uh, the route they chose being the A12, uh, then coming off at the turning for Brentwood and driving through it using the country roads and finding a place where they can stop off and put the fake plates over the uh, original ones. Uh, they found a place where Mick Steele uh, could meet the Essex boys and the others could park up close by and wait for the Range Rover uh, to turn up and when it does, this is their cue to set off to the uh, pre-chosen murder location. Uh, they also found a place which had to be further away from the Retterton Turnpike so Mick Steele could get the Essex boys to follow him so this would give time for the others to get into place uh, down the uh, farm track. Now at this location, um, being the Hungry Hippo pub car park, Mick Steele would leave his vehicle there and get into the Range Rover and make sure he sat behind the driver, Craig Rolf. so when they come to a halt at the closed gate down the track, he could get out into open space, head towards the gate uh, so the ambush could take place. Uh, the recce would have been timed so it was possible to carry out the plan to execute Tucker, Tate and Rolf. In part four, I discussed how they did a final recce the day before the murders and I got up to when they arrived at the farm track in Rettenden. In part five, I discussed a witness statement from an Alan Greyston who saw a suspicious male in a field next to the track walking back to his car which was parked at the entrance of the track and the witness noticed he had a pair of binoculars. Uh, this was on the 4th of December and two days before the murders and I discussed if it could have been a hitman hired by Mick Steele and the others um, and he was doing his final checks. I also discussed in that video uh, the call that put Jack Wombs in the village of Rettenden 
the day before the murders. So, uh, carrying on from that 4.39pm call uh, Jack Wombs received on his mobile from his home landline, um, is this the call that put him in Rettenden the day before the murders? I think it is. It's definitely used in the phone log evidence. If he has met up with the other two in the village of Rettenden and they've checked all the locations they will be using tomorrow, uh, then there's no need to contact each other via their mobiles as he's with Mick Steele and Darren Nichols. This could explain the lack of phone contact between the three after 1.31pm on the 5th. Did they arrive at the last location, uh, the farm track in Rettenden, shortly after 4pm to check uh, the last time it gets used on an evening and they still have access down to the uh, five bar gate and check the track for the, the final time? Um, as, as they're in the village of Rettenden, um, Jack Wum's mobile goes off at 4.39pm. And unbeknown to him at the time, it puts him in that small village uh, the day before the murders. In the trial, uh, this call becomes crucial and is used as evidence to convict him, along with the call, phone call between him and Darren Nichols the day after, uh, which was the night of the murders, uh, which was also made in Rettenden at 6.59pm, uh, round about the same time there were no more calls made or received by Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe, who were also in the uh, Rettenden area. We know uh, Jack Wombs' excuse for him being in the area of Rettenden uh, which is 63 miles away from his home address and about 57 miles from his place of work um, was that he was going to call at his uncle's house uh, which was apparently not too far from Rettenden and he was going to pick something up and his uncle wasn't in and apparently he posted something through his uncle's door letterbox uh, but it was proved later his uncle did not have a door letter box. Uh, so to me, it was a very weak excuse by him um, and his defence counsel. So, this 4.39pm call, uh, which is in the phone log evidence, is to me the call that puts Jack Wombs in the Retterton area the day before the murders and it was done in the late afternoon. Is he with Mick Steele and Darren Nichols doing their final checks at the track? And after he receives a call on his mobile phone uh, from his home landline, um, they decide to set off home, heading back down the A130, uh, then along the A127 up to the halfway house pub, then along the A128 past the Thorndon Country Park, then through Brentwood and join the A12 um, back up to uh, Mark's T. I mean, during that phone call that he received uh, from his house landline, um, it could have been an important call for him. And he had to tell the others that, uh, you know, he has to go. Uh, and they've more or less done all their uh, last checks anyway. So what I'm going to do now is go back to that 5.03pm uh, phone call that was made from a payphone box on the A127 close to the halfway house pub um, to Pat Tate's mobile. Now this call uh, was logged but it was not used in the phone log evidence at the trial. 
If you've been following these Day of the Murder videos, then you will know I have, I have spoken of this 5.03pm call before. And I have said that I will be coming back to this call in future videos. So I'm going to be talking about it in this video. Uh, like I say, this call was not put into the uh, phone log evidence. So it was not used at the trial. Uh, so it's a little difficult to work out if this call was made on the 5th, the day before the murders, or on the 6th, uh, the day of the murders. Now this 5.03pm call was made on the A127 close to the Halfway House pub here, uh, which is a big coincidence that the Halfway House pub was used by Mick Steele uh, to meet Tucker, Tate and Rolf and the others would park up close by uh, so let's have a quick look to see if it was possible for Jack Wombs and the others to leave the village of Rettenden at 4.39pm and get to a payphone box on the A127 close to the halfway house pub um, to phone Pat Tate's mobile uh, which was received at 503 so this is a Google map of Rettenden to the Halfway House pub on the A127 and over here uh, the red marker is White House Farm in Rettenden and over here to the left down here where the grey marker is and uh, that is the halfway house pub and as you can see um, there's about three ways um, you can leave at Rettenden and join the A127 ah uh, I mean that's the long way around um, the most possible route this one down to the A127 or you could just carry on down here and then go along the A127 along here uh, but yeah there's about three ways um, to leave Rettenden and uh, join on the A127 uh, so what I've decided to do because there's the roughly the same amount of times uh, to, to join the A127 um, I'm just gonna I mean what we've got 17 18 and a 20 minute um, I'm just gonna say um, the average time would take 18 minutes so that's what I'm going to be using um, is 18 minutes for the journey so Jack Wounds received a call on his mobile um, from his home landline at 4.39pm uh, say he has a, a one minute conversation when he receives that call to his mobile from his, his landline and they then set off from the farm track in Rettenden to the public payphone box on the A127 uh, close to the halfway house pub uh, so they have 23 minutes to get to that payphone box and Mick Steele can make a, a call to Pat Tate's mobile now from this Google map you can see the journey from the track um, to a payphone box close to the halfway house pub and, and it takes approximately 18 to 20 minutes. Uh, so yes, it is possible that after Jack Wombs received that call at 4.39pm, he and the others could set off from the track and get to the payphone box close to the halfway house pub on the A127 and make that call to Pat Tate's mobile at 5.03 p.m. So here we are on the A127 and just over here um, is the Halfway House pub. Uh, let's get a closer view for you. There we go. And this is where Darren Nichols states that Mick Steele uh, met the Essex boys that evening. 
and he parked with Jack Wombs at the back of the car park uh, just over here um, and then prior to the Range Rover turning up Jack Wombs changed his mind and he told Darren Nicholl to drive to the front of the car park uh, so they could be closer um, to the slip road so they could set off to the uh, pre-chosen murder location and according to Darren Nichols, the Passat parked at the front here, um, which was facing the pub. Um, whilst I'm at this location, I'm just going to mention that on the night of the murders, and prior to the Essex boys turning up in this car park, uh, Mick Steele's mobile pinged in the area of Childerditch, uh, which is just over here on the left hand side of the halfway house pub. Um, and I think just down here on the right hand side, I think there's Childerditch Lane. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this to the left is Childerditch and I'm pretty sure that uh, this pub um, would come under the area of Childerditch. Now, I suppose, depending on the form mass in this area, uh, like I say, it could have picked up these two calls whilst he was sat on his own um, in this pub car park uh, waiting for the Range Rover to turn up um, did Mick Steele ring Jack Wombs at 6.03pm uh, to see if they had put the uh, fake number plates over the original ones yet and, and Jack Wombs turns round on the phone and says uh, no Mick not yet uh, we're trying uh, but they won't stick due to the uh, wet weather uh, then at 6.09pm, Mick Steele, realising it's getting close uh, for the Essex boys turning up in the Range Rover, he rings Jack Wombs again um, to tell him there's no time for the plates as Tucker, Tate and Rolf will be turning up very soon and he needs them um, at the pub car park straight away. Um, that's what could have happened um, in them two telephone conversations uh, it's okay just getting back to this video um, about a final recce done um, a day before the murders I did say in a previous video I would be coming back to this 5.03pm call uh, which was made from a public payphone box close to this place here um, the halfway house pub on the uh, A127 and it was received by uh, Pat Tate on his mobile. Um, as I said earlier in this video, this call was not put into the um, phone log evidence. So it was not used at the trial. Um, so it's a little difficult to work out which day this call was made. Um, it was either the 6th of December, which was the evening of the murders. Or on the 5th of December, which was the day before the murders. And if it was made on the, the 5th, it could go a long way to prove in these recce videos that it could have been Mick Steele and the others making this call after leaving Rettenden after that 4.39pm call Jack Wombs received on his mobile um, from his landline. Um, they then set off back the way they came on the final recce and they pull up at a, a pre-chosen phone box here on the A127 uh, where Mick Steele will phone Pat Tate's mobile and tell him um, he'll phone him tomorrow so they can meet up and he can show him where this intended drugs drop is going to be. Um, I have covered this 5.03pm phone call 
if it was made on the 6th um, in a previous three-parter video uh, I think it was part 28, 29 and 30 uh, where I talked about Darren Nichols and if he had uh, knowledge of the trap prior to the murders and how uh, this call could have been made prior to the murders that night I'm also uh, going to be coming back to this location and the 5.03pm call again in a later video and who it could have been who made that call um, close to here um, at a payphone box if it was made on the uh, 6th, uh, the day of the murders as, as it couldn't have been Mick Steele, Jack Wombs or Darren Nichols as they would have been at Mark's Tea at that time uh, which is about 26 miles away so if this call was made on the 6th then Mick Seal, Jack Wombs and Darren Nichols must have had an accomplice um, I have narrowed uh, down who this person could be and it just might shock you um, who it is and could have played his part in getting rid of the Essex boys. So back to the day before the murders. And if this call was made on the 5th. Was it Mick Steele making this call. From a payphone box close to the half house pub on the A127. To Pat Tate's mobile at 5.03pm. They leave the last place they had to check, which was White House Farm in Rettenden. And just after Jack Wombs received a call on his mobile from his home landline, um, which was at 4.39pm. Uh, and then it's about a tw 18 to 20 minute drive um, from Rettenden to the halfway house pub. And they pull up close by on the A127 to make that call to Pat Tate's mobile. And it is possible for them to make that journey within the time slot I've mentioned. Um, the next part of this video uh, just may convince you that a final recce was done by Mick Steele and the others the day before the murders. As this 5.03pm call was 100% linked to the executions uh, for me. So what we'll do now is look at the phone log evidence um, from the 5th, uh, the day before the murders. And as you can see, 4.39pm, um, uh, just here. Um, Jack Wombs landline, um, it rings Jack Wombs mobile and then they've got 24 minutes uh, to get to that payphone box on the A127 um, so yeah like it like it explained just a moment ago it is possible and um, and as I've explained before, uh, this 5.03pm call to Pat Tate's mobile um, from a payphone box on the A127 is not used in the phone log evidence. Um, and I don't know why. Uh, as to me, um, it's an important call in this case for me. Um, but as you can see, um, it's just not there. Um, so... As I look at the phone log evidence on the 5th, uh, the day before the murders, and look at the calls after 5.03pm, we can see Pat Tate rings uh, Tony Tucker at 5.08pm. And they use their uh, mobiles uh, to do this. I think uh, Tony Tucker missed this call as he rings uh, Pat Tate uh, up just two minutes later uh, at 5.10pm 
Uh, this call may have also uh, been missed. Because at 5.11pm, 11, Pat Tate rings Tony Tucker. Now, I actually think those two uh, uh, actually spoke on the 5.11pm call. And Pat Tate has told Tony Tucker that he's just received a call from Mick Steele from a payphone uh, somewhere. Telling him he'll be phoning him tomorrow with a place to meet up. And show him and the others where this intended drugs drops going to be um, in the Essex area. Um, after Pat Tate has, has got through to Tony Tucker and, and told him Mick Steele has been in touch, uh, they decide to let Craig Rolf know. So at 5.12 p.m. Pat Tate rings... Craig Rolf's landline. Then at 5.20pm, Tony Tucker rings Craig Rolf's landline. Then, just a little bit further down here, at 5.35pm, Pat Tate uses his landline to phone Craig Rolf's landline. So, just after the 5.03pm call, uh, Pat Tate received on his mobile from a payphone box close to the halfway house pub on the A127, there's definitely some frantic phone calls uh, made between Tucker, uh, Tate and Rolf. I mean, it looks to me this 5.03pm call was made on the 5th, uh, the day before the murders. There's just too much going on after 5.03pm between Tucker Tate and Rolf. Um, so yeah, I think this the call was made on the uh, the 5th. Uh, after Mick Steele and the others, you know, they do their final recce on the 5th. Uh, and they're at um, White House Farm. Uh, and Jack Wounds receives a call on his mobile from his own landline, um, putting him... In the village of Rettenden via the, the phone log evidence. Uh, so they all set off uh, to their last part of their master plan uh, and use a payphone box close to the halfway house pub on the A127. Uh, and Mick Steele phones Pat Tate uh, to tell him he'll phone him tomorrow with a place and a time to meet up. So he can show him where a light aircraft will be landing in the next day or so um, with a consignment of coke. Uh, and will be uh, Tucker Tate and Rolf's job um, to, to rob um, the coke from the Canning Town firm. Uh, and they'll split the drugs between themselves. Uh, but this was in fact uh, just a ploy to lure the Essex boys uh, to their deaths. And looking at the phone log evidence right now, Jack Wooms receives a, a call on his mobile from his own landline at 4.39pm, um, which puts him in the area of Rettenden, and for whatever reason, he had to leave. So Mick Steele said they had to do one more, one more thing on their way back, uh, which was to call Pat Tate using a public payphone box. After Mick Steele made the call at 5.03pm to Pat Tate's mobile. Uh, and then as you can see, there's frantic calls being made in quick succession by Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and, and, and Craig Rolf, uh, which backs up the call to Pat Tate's mobile um, from a payphone box on the A127. Uh, close to the halfway house pub, um, which was probably made on the fifth, and, and Mick Steele, Jack Wilms, and, and Darren Nichols, and anyone else um, who were doing their final recce uh, the day before their murders. Um, last of all, 
Before I wrap this video up, um, if this call was made on the 5th, uh, the day before the murders, which I strongly believe it was, why wasn't it put in the phone log evidence for the trial? Um, I thought about this whilst making uh, these recce videos and come to the conclusion that it was not used as phone log evidence at the trial because it implicated Darren Nichols. You see, Darren Nichols can't talk about this call if it was made on the 5th, the day before the murders. Um, at a payphone box close to the halfway house pub on the uh, A127 uh, because he will be implicating himself in the murders and did have prior knowledge the murders were going to take place as he's done a recce with Mick Steele and Jack Wounds and the uh, police can't use him as a super grass because he had prior knowledge uh, the murders were going to take place and he would have been charged under the uh, Joint Enterprise Law. Um, they had to leave this 5.03pm call out of the uh, phone log evidence at the trial. Um, like I spoke earlier, I will be going back to this 5.03pm um, call um, in a later video and discuss if an accomplice could have made uh, the call on the 6th uh, to Pat Tate telling him um, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe uh, to meet Mick Steele at the halfway house at 6.15pm and then he waited there for Mick Steele and the others to turn up and... Uh, played his part in the uh, murders. Uh, so yeah, I will be coming back to the 5.03pm uh, call uh, in a later video. Um, but to me, having done the research on these recce videos, it just seems more plausible uh, that this 5.03pm call to Pat Tate was made on the 5th uh, due to the... Uh, possibility of, of Jack Wombs and the others leaving uh, the White House farm track at 4.39pm and get to the uh, payphone box on the A127 and making that call uh, to Pat Tate's mobile. Uh, then after receives the Pat Tate receives uh, that call um, you know, there's just frantic phone calls between all three. You know, Pat Tate, Tony Tucker, uh, and mostly. And then they're contacting, well, trying to get hold of, of Craig Rolfe uh, on his landline. So the years frantic activity going on in them phone logs. And it just all fits in for me. Um, I do think that um, call was made on the uh, 5th from um, a payphone box on the A127. And it's just... Too much of a coincidence um, that that is where Mick Steele will be uh, meeting the Essex boys uh, at that place close to um, the uh, halfway house pub. So that's it for part six of these recce videos. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the YouTube subscribers. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, I don't post my videos on the Facebook group until a, a week after. Um, I've uploaded them on here. Um, so you'll get to watch uh, the videos first. Um, and don't forget, you can join the biggest Essex Boys group on Facebook. The Real Essex Boys Murder Club. Um, last time I checked, I think we had over 30, 30 31,000 members. Um... It just keeps growing on a daily basis. Um, but all we ask is respect other people's opinions on there. As, as we all have our own theories on, on what we think um, happened that night. And last of all, I'd like to thank the admins who do a fantastic job of keeping the group um, ticking over. Uh, so until next time, take care.